Before we get started on the Dharma talk, please join me in invoking the Buddha's name three times. Namo Shakyamuni Buddha Namo Shakyamuni Buddha Namo Shakyamuni Buddha Dear Venerable Teacher, dear Sangha, good afternoon. Scouring the audience. Okay, not too many new faces, so I'm gonna repeat myself. But if you are new, then we are speaking on the Dhammapada, which is one of the oldest and most important Buddhist texts. And so we've been going through the first chapter so far, and so we've covered the first uh, 12 verses in the first chapter of the twin verses, Yamaka Vaga. So today we will continue on with chap uh, verses 13 and 14. So we have giving you a link to the translation that I created. So if you have your phone and you're able to use that link, you're able to follow along. If not, then well, you can look it up later. <laughs> but, um, as usual, I will recite the verses. I will go through the story of why the verse was created or given, and then we'll go through some of that commentary. So verses 13 and 14. As rain breaks through a house with a bad roof, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. As rain does not break through a well-roofed house, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. This verse was given during the time of the Buddha when he visited his, um, when he went back home and visited his family and parents and parent um, and cousins and whatnot. And so it's a story by one of his cousins, Nanda. So Nanda was uh, the Buddha's step cousin and he was a very handsome man and he was betrothed to um, Princess Janapana Kalyani, which means uh, beauty of the land. So she was one of the most beautiful women of the land. So they were destined to marry each other. They were in love and they were soulmates and whatnot. So, you know, you get the, sh the, the deal. But after the Buddha uh, gave a sermon, went for alms, he, on the, he was there for a few days. But on the third day, he went to Nanda's house and he intentionally left his alms bowl there. And so it is uh, uncourteous to uh, tag or flag down a monk or nun to say, hey, you forgot your bowl. So instead of flagging them down, could you please shut the door? So instead of uh, uh, running after the Buddha, he simply just followed the Buddha with his alms bowl back to the monastery. And so once back to the monastery, the Buddha was like, hey, Nanda, so you're here, you're gonna, you're gonna become a monk, right? And so, of course, Buddha being the Buddha, he was, uh, he couldn't say no. So he was like, uh, sure, I'll become a monk. But as he was leaving, his uh, fiancée, the princess, she shouted out and she said, your better will, or, or, uh, or my love, don't, don't forgive on me, come back to me. And so, even though he was hesitant to ordain as a monk, he did it because you can't say no to the Buddha. But, so he was ordained as a monk, and uh, after a while they moved to a different monastery that was further out, and he was very discontented with his life. He wasn't there to, to be a monk. He didn't want to be a monk. He still had the passion, the love, that he wanted to marry his fiancée, and he kept on thinking about it all the time. So he was very disheartened. And the Buddha took notice of this. And so the Buddha, through meditative supernatural power, uh, took Nanda to one of the heavens and showed him a, a retinue of devas, beautiful deva, female devas. And he asked Nanda, Nanda, what do you think about these devas? Are they pretty? He was like, yes, they're they're." gorgeous or beautiful. And he asked him, are they prettier than your fiance? He's like, comparing them to my fiance, they are way prettier than my fiance. 
And so the Buddha told him, well, if that's what you want, if these devas are, are what you want, then you have to practice diligently. You have to meditate and, 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 and escape um, or be able to attain a higher state of, of, of enlightenment or, con or consciousness. And if you do that, then this will be your reward. So uh, Nanda, wanting that reward of the plethora of beautiful devas, he practiced diligently. And he was uh, kind of, he was diligent in his practice, but the other monks knew why he was practicing. And so they kind of tease him every once in a while, like, mm, look at Nanda, he's just, he's just practicing for the sake of the devas. He wants all those devas for himself. So they tease him. But in the process of his practice, he, because he was, he was practicing correctly, the practice itself was correct, the intention was incorrect, but the practice was still correct. And, be, and because of that, his mind started to uh, become calmer, it started to release some of those attachments of worldly desires and passions, and he eventually became an arahat. He, he attained full enlightenment. He was able to escape and attain nirvana. And so once that attainment was uh, made, then he, of course he had let go of all those attachments and desires for sensual desire and pleasure and all that. And he went back to the Buddha and said, Venerable Sir, I no longer want that reward of the devas. He was like, and the Buddha told him, well, as soon as you attained arahatship, I already knew that. So he was released from that uh, um, uh, what do they call it? A mm, He was really from that job, I suppose, right, of, of doing that specifically for that reason. And then walking back to his uh, place, Nanda, he again saw the other monks, and the monks were teasing him, and like, oh, look, it's Nanda again. He, he's only practicing for the devas. And Nanda told him, told the venerables, venerable, venerable sir, I no longer wish for that attainment. I've escaped the bonds of attachment for sensual desire. And he said that something else, but the monks were like, oh no, Nanda is claiming to have attained enlightenment. That's a serious offense. For monastics, there's four major serious offenses that if you break any of them, you are expelled from the monastery. And so lying by your attainments is one of them. And so figuring that he's uh, lied about his attainments, they went to the Buddha and they told the Buddha, Venerable Sir, Nanda is claiming that he's attained an arahatship. And the Buddha said he is not uh, pretending anything. He truly has attained arahatship. He's escaped the bonds of suffering and has released his desires. And so after um, he confirmed that with the monks, that's when he gave the verses. And I'll repeat it again. As rain breaks through a house, with a bad roof, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. As rain does not break through a well-roofed house, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. So if we think about that deeply, right, if we truly can understand or attempt to understand Buddhism, we know that Buddhism is all a, is a mind-centered practice, religion, philosophy, whatever you want to call it, I don't care. But it's mind-centered, right? So all our happiness and unhappiness, our fears, our desires, our wishes, our jealousies, everything is mind-centered, it's mind-created. No one makes you happy, no one makes you unhappy. You make yourself unhappy or, un or happy or un unhappy. And we attempt, we are unable to uh, usually see that clearly. We are in a state where we think we're the masters of our mind, we're not the master of anything. <laughs> Certainly not your mind. If you were the master of your mind, you'd be at, at will be able to stop thinking altogether. You'd stop. You'd be able to stop being angry. You'd stop uh, harming yourself and others. You'd stop suffering at will. Clearly, you can't do that. Which is why we're here, hopefully. And so we're not the masters of our mind. Our mind is in control of us, but the problem is, is that what we think, what we perceive, 
those ideas, those perceptions are false. Our mind is in a state where it is an interpreter of things, right? When we do a meditation, for instance, I always say when we hear a distraction arise or sound or noise or feeling, right? Our mind is already trying to make up a story for it. Someone opened the door, you're thinking who's at the door, who's, who's here, why are they interrupting? Why are they late? Why, whatever it may be, right? We're already making up a story and we don't know why. We're creating an excuse for them. And that excuse may or may not be false, uh, true, but we don't know. But our mind is already making up a story. It's interpreting what we are perceiving. And part of that problem is because we're uncontrolled, because we are not the masters of our mind, we think that what we're perceiving is reality and it is not. And so as we practice, especially as we go deeper into meditation, we'll hopefully, the goal is to uh, recognize those false interpretations, right? If someone cuts you off in the road, if someone abruptly gets up and leaves, if someone that's, that you're attracted to looks at you for a second longer than normal, we're already making interpretations. Oh, that person coming after a jerk. They don't, they don't care about my time. The person that abruptly walked down, maybe they forgot something. Maybe their stove is still on. Maybe their baby's in the car. I don't know. Someone looked at you and they're like, oh, maybe they're interested in me. We're already making interpretations. We're already, <laughs> we're already creating false perception, potential false perceptions of things that we, that are happening. Right? Whether some of those interpretations are true or not, you don't know. Our mind is already making up stories for it. If you take a second, look around. I want you, everyone to make mental notes of what you see. Just take a few seconds. Mental notes of what you see around you. I bet some of the things on your list are statues, table, bell, a couple of monks, uh, a camera. But I bet nothing was not one of your words on the list. Nothing, right? If you think about it, nothing, empty space takes up the majority of what's around you. <laughs> Why is that not on your list? Because our mind's already interpreting what we see. It attempts to always categorize things. It attempts to make sense of things, right? Our mind is mistaken because when it sees something that it doesn't know or understand, it already makes excuses for you. So when you see an accident, you truly don't know what happened, but your mind's already making up an excuse, making up a story. Maybe it's a female, maybe they're old, maybe they're young, maybe they weren't paying attention, maybe they're drinking and driving, we don't know. You do not know. But your mind will already make up stories for what you're seeing. Right? So part of that practice is to watch how that mind works is to watch what happens during our thinking process and to be able to see truly what is happening, what is true, what is a uh, reality. So if you see an accident, you see the door open, what we, what, we what we practice during meditation is what? When a thought arises or a distraction arises, what do we do during meditation? Label. Right? Labeling is the easiest and quickest way to apply reality without the interpretation part of it. Right? Because if you're meditating and hear the door open, again, you're going to go back to those excuses. Who's at the door? Why are they opening it? Why are they here? Why are they disturbing my meditation? It's none of that. None of that is true. It doesn't matter. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. What is true is that the door had opened that there was a sound, someone walked in, whatever it may be, you add a one word label to it, sound, door, and leave it as is, because that's what reality is. It's just a sound, it's just a door. It's not the person walking in, it's not why they're here, it's not what they want, it's not who they are, none of that. None of that is beneficial to the practice, right? But we do that on a daily basis, all the time. I like this, I don't like that. He looks nice, she doesn't. Whatever, we're always, we're always 
uh, creating stories versus just seeing things as they are, right? Seeing things as they are is the ultimate goal in Buddhism, right? All this interpretation, all this story making and telling is because of ignorance, right? Ignorance in Buddhism is not mm, the mundane concept of ignorance like stupidity or unknowingness. It's not seeing things as they are. Not seeing things as they are is this whole adding your interpretation, your perceptions, your false ideas to things. Seeing things as they are is the door open, sound, door. The dog barking, dog or sound. Not why are they barking, who's out there, what kind of dog is it? Is it a puppy? Is it a horse? <laughs> is it a cow? Whatever, it doesn't matter. None of that is helpful for you. It just drags you on. None of this, this to say is easy, clearly. But it, it opens that door, it opens that gateway to uh, allow ourselves to really see things as they are. That way we're not making those false ideas, perceptions, and we're able to truly practice and truly calm our mind. Part of our suffering is because of all these interpretations that we make. Someone's yelling at you, someone's trying to fight you, right? We're already, we're reactionary beings. And so if someone's yelling at us, instead of actually listening and trying to be helpful, we're already thinking of comebacks. We're already thinking of, of how we can retaliate, of what we can say back, of how, you know, someone's cussing us out. We're already thinking of what to say next, right? Someone's yelling at us, someone's arguing at us. We're already trying to fight back. We're already trying to argue back. For what reason? Part of that retaliation is our ignorance. So what do we do? What's the, what's the goal here? And we'll get to it in, later, in the later verses, but the goal here is to apply three things. Morality, meditation, and wisdom. These are the three categories of the Eightfold Path, right? The Eightfold Path is a collection, it gets collected in these three categories. So the first thing is morality. Morality here is to watch that thinking, that interpretation process. To not allow our, our biases, our judgments, our, um, our, our negative habits, our jealousy, our anger, our fear, our discrimination to, to interpret what's going on. To simply see things as they are. To be, to be mentally moral. And once we do that, then it's once we are able to recognize that, then as we're meditating and we are able to see that a little bit more clearly and really be able to see that our mind is constantly doing that and we recognize that that, that craziness, then it's easier for us to be like, okay, well, I don't want that, so let me do something about it, right? And so we become more diligent in our practice, more diligent in our meditation, where then our mind starts to calm, it starts to slow down, it starts to be more tranquil, right? And so then we get into the second category of meditation or concentration. We're able to really just have that uh, mental stillness. And from that stillness, then we're able to develop wisdom. Wisdom is the, is the goal here, right? Wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is not something that's relative or that's um, your basic, uh, that's what I'm looking for. It's not mundane knowledge, right? It's something you can just read out of a book and be like, okay, I get it. It's not that kind of a thing. Right? Something it's it's ex experiential. You have to experience that kind of wisdom. And it's only through that experience that you're able to have the aha moments, to have enlightenment. You can't just read a book and be like, oh, okay, this makes sense, and just move on with your life. What's the point there? You just wasted your time. <laughs> Part of practice in Buddhism is is to Study is very important. You have to study, you have to read, you have to know. 
but you also have to apply what you study and what you read and what you know. Otherwise, you just waste the time. You're just accumulating knowledge, right? Reading and studying is the knowledge base. Practicing is the experiential base. It's, that's where the wisdom comes from. It's from the actual practice, not from the studying part. But if you need to study, obviously, otherwise, how are you going to know anything? <laughs> And so as we start to uh, recognize that those, those, those um, um, false interpretations, those false stories that we say and, and give ourselves and, and give to the, our uh, perceptions and experiences, then it would be, then our suffering lessens, right? Because we're not making up stories for things. We're not judging very quickly. We're not reacting as quickly. We're able to really stop and Watch our mind, watch our thinking. Everything's mind-based, remember? So everything starts as a thought. So if you're in a heated argument, for instance, right? Instead of um, listening to what's going on, part of our reaction is that we are um, apathetic to, what's, to, to the situation, right? We're not empathetic to the other person. And we forget that, yeah, suffering exists, but we ignore that others are suffering as well. We ignore other people's suffering. And so when they're yelling at us or they're trying to argue with us, we ignore that fact and we are trying to defend our own suffering at that point. Right? And so we retaliate. We don't listen. If we're able to really listen, right, and be compassionate, then we can recognize that that person is yelling or arguing because they are also suffering. If we're able to recognize that, then our, our mental state of trying to uh, find a witty comeback or a sarcastic remark will fade away, hopefully. Right? And once that fades away and we are truly there with them, then our suffering doesn't exist, won't come up, won't come up. Our suffering only happens because we're reacting to something that is not to our expectations, right? We all have expectations. We have expectations of how people should be, how should they act, how they should live. We have expectations of how much money we should be making, the house that we live in, the type of car we have, the type of friends we have. We have all these expectations on life. These expectations are what causes you suffering. Because when your expectations are not met, then you're sad, you, you, you're frustrated, you're angry. Oh, I didn't get my dream job. Oh, I can't afford this dream house. My car broke down, I just bought it. My friends are talking behind my back. My husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend cheated on me. All your expectations of what life should be are now being torn down. And we get hurt, we suffer from these expectations because we don't understand reality. We don't understand impermanence. Impermanence is another big word and topic in Buddhism. But everything is impermanent. And because they're impermanent, suffering's gonna happen. Suffering is necessary if you wanna be happy. To truly be happy, you have to suffer. And suffering needs to be uh, experienced. It needs to be understood, it needs to be um, there for you to see it. Otherwise, you don't know what happiness is if you don't experience the opposite of happiness or unhappiness. Okay, in like three minutes. Just think about that. The next time you Next, the next time something happens to you, or you're in a situation, or whatever it may be, watch what you're thinking. Ask yourself, where are these thoughts coming from? Why are these thoughts arising? Why am I having them? Why do I think this way? One of my more um, advanced methods of meditation is called, I call it why, why meditation. You practice why meditation by literally just asking yourself why. So let's say you're angry at someone, right? Why are you angry? Oh, because they did this. 
Why? Because of that. Why? Because of this. Why? Because of that. Why? Because of him. Because of her. Why, 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 why? You keep asking yourself why until you get to the real core reason of why you're angry or upset or jealous or whatever it may be. Right? Sometimes it'll take several meditate sessions. Maybe it'll take hours. Maybe it'll take days. It doesn't, the, the time frame isn't important. What is important is that you truly get to the actual core reason of why you're suffering. Now, once you get to that core reason, now you have something graspable. Now you have something that's tangible you can do something about. In most situations, in most cases, it's something that is um, doable. It's not something that's impossible to do. Maybe it's someone you have to distance yourself from. Maybe it's someone you have to unfriend. Maybe it's someone you have to change the type of situation or relationship you have. I don't know. Only you can know the answer. But at least now you have that reason. You have that core reason. And now you have something that's actually you can do something about. Versus just sitting in your suffering, agonizing over <laughs> whatever it is you're suffering with. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So our next couple of verses will be the conclusion of this. What are your questions, concerns, emotional outbursts? I don't want to hear those, but in case you have them, feel free to <laughs> express them later. Yes, sir. Passion from energy? What do you mean by energy? Well, even if we're like in the state of like peace and love and happiness, um, but you have to do something, like you have to learn to like work out or you have to train for something, but you're like pretty passionless. And you know what I mean? Like where where does passion come into play? Like how can you use a good where is your like energy? Or is it passion? You know what I mean? You're mistaken, I would think you're mistaken passion with desire and want. Passion is an energy, right? You have to have passion to practice, right? You have to have the passion to do things that you love and enjoy, right? That's passion, it's the, is the, is, it's the passion in a psychological sense is the energy you put forth onto things that you enjoy doing, right? Um, And kind of answer your question because you kind of already answered your own question. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, if we go back to like the five hindrances, for example, all right, the first hindrance is. Um, Sensual pleasure or too much passion, right? And then you get to restlessness, which is not enough passion or not enough energy, right? And so, luckily, Buddhism has a word called or has a term, the middle way, right? Which is uh, the balance between too much and too little or not enough and too much, right? And so, comes to a point where I can't answer the question for you because I don't know what level of passion or energy you have. You can answer that, but you can use your own, your own interpretation to attempt to see what is beneficial or what may not be beneficial, right? I can't tell you if going to the gym is going to make you feel better or not, if you have enough passion or not enough passion for it, right? But if you are able to do something that you're passionate about without an attachment to it, right, then you can move on and let it be when it's done, right? If, let's say you go to 
go to the gym and you're already leaving and walking to your car and you're like, oh, I already missed the gym. I don't know if anyone ever thinks that, but if you are, then you're probably a little crazy. I already want to leave the gym before I even get into the gym. <laughs> but the point here is if you're able to leave something that you are truly passionate about or have a lot of excitement or energy for and you're able to leave and distance yourself from it without any remorse or regrets or attachment to it, you're on a good path, right? If you do have any remorse or regrets or you're kind of missing or have that attachment to it, then you know you have to fluctuate that energy a little bit, right? To, to, to attempt to see why you have that slight attachment to it. So what is it about it that it's causing you that pull of energy toward it, the attachment toward it, right? So it's through introspection that, that you can come to that conclusion. But usually if you're in a situation where like, where you're about to do something or eat something or try something that you know you really like or really don't like, you have, it's easier to see, right? Versus something that's just mundane, like going to a grocery store. I don't think anybody loves going to the grocery store, right? It's a chore for most people. But that has very neutral uh, energy, right? Going to an event or a concert or whatever has a, has a high energy, right? You know, it's something you really enjoy. Going to a funeral has very low energy because nobody wants to go to a funeral, right? And so you have to be able to categorize. If you're able to categorize where that type of passion and energy falls into, then it's easier to see the big picture versus just going with the flow and hoping for the best. Make sense? Is there a sh short answer questions? Okay. <laughs> So, when does passionate energy help people who are in non-motivated states? And you can, I mean, you can self-reflect and kind of figure out why you're not in any self-motivated type of demeanor, but it's really hard to get the root cause of non-action, not wanting to, not wanting to perform action. And, you know, a lot of ways. That has a core reason too. What would you say? I don't know. What is the core reason for you? <laughs> tell you what it is. Not psychic yet. I can tell you. But lethargy is again one of the five hindrances, and there's a reason it's there. I don't know what your reason that you're lethargic for. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you're angry, I don't know, <laughs> right? It goes back to meditation. You have to reflect and find that core reason. There's a core reason for everything, trust me. It, as mundane as it is, there's a core reason. I'm hungry. Well, the reason is because there's no food in your stomach. You need to eat. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I'm tired. I'm excited. I'm happy. All those have reasons. Sometimes they're good reasons, sometimes they're bad reasons, but no have reasons. Again, it goes back to your mind interpreting good and bad. Why is it good? Why is it bad? Exactly. It's your job. Find out. Okay. Yes, sir. Got it. Get it? Good. All right. And pass my time. So we will um, 
share the merit, transfer the merit, and then go to chanting for today. Namo Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo Shakyamuni Buddha. For any positive karmic action we've accumulated here today, we wish to transfer the merit to all sentient beings and wish them full enlightenment. General service, page seven. Shakyamuni Buddha, Maitreya Hall. 
all dharma guarding deva bodhisattvas and the glorious mountain assembly of buddhas and bodhisattvas.